We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for the introductory film that gave us an impression also what we are talking about today. I hand over to Amy Crocker for the welcome to all our speakers and participants. Thank you, Jutta. Um, and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening for participants joining from other time zones. Um, my name is Amy Crocker, and on behalf of this dynamic coalition on children's rights in the digital environment and the organization I represent, ECPAT International, I'm really pleased to welcome you to this DC session at the IGF 2021. Clearly, we'd all like to be together in Katowice, um, but as we've seen over the past few years, we can also have some quite fruitful online hybrid discussions um, and we hope to get the most out of this session. As we've just seen in the video, the theme of this year is Internet United. So the, the Internet is bringing us together today, even with some difficult circumstances around the world. So, so welcome. A quick note on the run of show. Um, this is a roundtable discussion. So we have several speakers lined up, ready to help frame this discussion, give their views. Um, and we'll also be posing questions to them and also inviting you to engage. And we really welcome that. Um, so please feel free to use the chat to ask questions or make comments um, and raise your hand if you would like to speak. Um, I believe the session is being recorded and there's a transcript and that will be available afterwards. After the session, we submit some key outcomes and call to action to the IGF, and later in the month, we will submit the full report on the session. We'll also have a few uh, polling questions. Let's hope the technology works with us, um, and I'll share some instructions in the chat. Um, and I'll now quickly introduce the session and then hand back to our, to our moderator, Jutta Kroll. So, why are we here? So the title of our discussion today is Regulate um, or Prevent to Protect Children, a False Dichotomy. And an overarching question for this session is, how do we balance or align the principles of regulation of digital environments and prevention strategies to protect children? And in this discussion, we seek to explore um, the key IGF 2021 theme of emerging regulation with sub themes of content moderation, human rights compliance, data governance and trust globally and locally. And, you know, why is the theme so important in general and so important for us as a dynamic coalition? Um, it's estimated that one in three internet users worldwide is a child, and this makes children a key stakeholder in all the issues of, gov of internet governance. However, their voices, their voices are too often not heard and their rights are often not prioritized. And in particular for this session, we're focusing on, um, particularly on aspects of online violence, abuse and exploitation, including the rights of victims and survivors of violence to protection and privacy. And we know, um, and we have uh, experts on this call, that the adoption of the UN General Comment number 25 on children's rights in relation to the digital environment in uh, March, April 2021, um, demonstrates that the rights of children online are now equal to those offline. And it's important to point out that the relationship between what happens online and offline uh, to children is also an important part of the, this discussion we will be having today. Um, for the Dynamic co Coalition, the primary importance of children's rights is also grounded in several key pieces of legislation that are guiding us. Uh, one is Article 3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, and second at the EU level um, is Article 24 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, both of which demand uh, that the best interests of children are uh, prioritised are a primary consideration in all actions taken by public authorities and private institutions. And, you know, while few people oppose the fundamental principle of children's rights or protection, um, including the right to protection from violence, there are different perspectives being brought to the topic of how best to approach this challenge. And this is driving and being driven, of course, by a broader set of societal questions being raised currently about how to manage our digital world. 
And at the core of the digital transformation being seen in many countries and regions is the issue of whether, how, and how much to regulate digital or online service providers, online platforms. And as we're seeing in pieces of legislation being tabled around the world uh, to discuss harmful and illegal content online, um, thinking of the Digital Services Act in the EU, the Online Harms Bill in the UK, and Online Safety Act in Australia, to, to mention uh, three, internet governance is experiencing a transition from self-regulation regulatory to regulatory environments and the legal policy technical and societal issues around this are complicated and it's clear that there is no single thing that can effectively protect children from violence online um, I think it's widely understood and accepted that we need a broad range of conditions including but um, not limited to strong and clear legal frameworks um, addressing harmful and illegal activities activity, uh, the development and deployment of innovative technology for prevention and response, and also prevention through education and support with children, young people, communities, frontline workers, also with perpetrators of, of violence themselves. Um, but the arguments for and against regulation often default to binary or seemingly mutually exclusive positions, uh, which misses the nuance and the compromise needed to identify sustainable cross-sector solutions to violence against children both in real life and in digital environments, again, acknowledging the interlinked nature of, of, of these two uh, dimensions. Um, advocates of regulation may argue that technology companies have failed to self-regulate effectively and at scale across the sector and globally. And they point out that the technologies to address online violence are proven to work, but are not being taken up and deployed sufficiently widely or with appropriate levels of transparency and accountability. Proponents of a public health approach um, may argue that too much focus has been placed on regulation and technological interventions at the cost of investment and focus on prevention strategies that tackle these social problems at the root. And when considering these two perspectives and the many others that, that surround them and fall between them, um, um, we also need to be asking ourselves some key questions. You know, what is our tolerance for risk affecting children online and our threshold for harm? What is our attitude towards our online privacy and our online activities and the compromises perhaps needed to ensure safety for children and other vulnerable groups? Um, and I just want to quickly highlight um, a recent piece of uh, research carried out by ECPAT International um, in, in partnership with um, eight of its uh, members in eight EU member states. Um, and this was a survey conducted um, on public attitudes towards um, online privacy and child protection. And we found some, you know, really interesting, uh, interesting facts that were sort of, that were uh, consistent across all the eight countries where we polled. And these were that 73% of adults believe children cannot go online without being approached by adults looking to harm them. Nearly seven out of 10 feel there is not much of any privacy online anyway. 76 of respondents across all the EU countries were willing to give up some of their personal privacy to allow for automated tools to detect images of child sexual abuse and detect other forms of sexual exploitation of children. And 68% of respondents in the eight countries support plans by the EU to introduce new legislation on the detection, removal and reporting of child sexual abuse material by private companies. So without ever compromising on the primacy of children's best interests and their right to protection, both online and offline, this dynamic coalition seeks to listen to different perspectives, identify some common ground, common ground and try and consider sort of a broad, sustainable and nuanced approach to protecting and ensuring the rights of children in digital environments. So on that note, um, I would like to hand back to our uh, moderator, Yuta Kroll, um, and she will introduce the speakers, and then I believe we will uh, be having the first of our polling questions. Thank you, Yuta. Thank you, Amy, for your introduction and for preparing the ground for the debate that we will have now in the next uh, 80 minutes or so. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers of today to you. And I'd like to start with Sonia Livingston. She's a professor at the London School of Economics, well known. And I, I do remember also, I think a founding member of the Dynamic Coalition, which was then named Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety and the general comment uh, number 25 on children's rights in the digital environment gave us reason to rename uh, the Dynamic Coalition and to make it more 
appropriate to uh, what we are facing now nearly uh, or more than 30 years uh, since the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child has come into force. And Sonia is also uh, was an active member or the most active member, I would say, of the working group that worked together with the uh, Child's Committee of the United Nations to uh, realize uh, the General Command number 25. <clears throat> I, I need to say that Sonia needs to head to another session after 40 minutes from now on. So we will give her the uh, floor then first, but let me name the other speakers in the session. We have Patrick Burton. He is Executive Director of the Center of Justice and Tr Crime Prevention in South Africa and has extensive experience at both research and policy level on child and youth victimization, school violence prevention, and youth resilience. Welcome, Patrick, to our panel. Then we have Thiago Tavares. I think he was also there when uh, in 2007, we started the work of the Dynamic Coalition. Yeah. Thiago Chavares uh, has a Bachelor in Law and Administration, as well as a Master Degree in Management and Social Development. He is long with Safer Internet Brazil and has just told us at the beginning, before we started the session, a bit that is also a riskful position in these days now in Brazil. Maybe you can go into that further on. Then we have Michael Tanks from uh, the Internet Watch Foundation uh, based in, in London. And <clears throat> the Internet Watch Foundation has <clears throat> long been working, I, I think nearly since the beginning of the internet to make the internet a safer place and to prevent child sexual abuse material featuring on the internet. Um, and we have Andreas Hautz, uh, my colleague from Germany, from the German Child Protection Organization, um, Jugendschutznet. Um, <clears throat> he's part of the unit for international work there, coordinating the uh, international project Arachnid. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us for this session. Uh, we have now time for your short interventions. And I would really be happy if you could stick to two minutes more or less uh, so that we have uh, enough time left uh, to, to discuss then further with participants in the room. Sonia, please, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you so much, um, Jutta. And um, I'll note that um, you did send some questions in advance to, um, to kind of prompt my reflections. So I'm, I, and they did indeed prompt me. Um, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll focus on those because I do think they're interesting and they do um, perhaps uh, put, put your finger on some kind of tricky issues for us. So one um, you said was, um, do we need to separate issues between addressing illegal uh, and harmful um, content and conduct? Um, and this is currently um, a contentious mess in Britain and probably um, everywhere else with our particular regulation. Um, it really provoked me to think um, that in our field, perhaps uniquely, um, we have uh, some truly problematic um, uh, contestants or combatants. Uh, it seems very peculiar to many of us I know to advocate for child safety and child rights and to find ourselves somehow up against those who um, advocate for a democracy and free expression. And in various forms, this kind of debate has um, uh, proved in, in, um, incredibly problematic. Um, uh, and I see it every day on Twitter in the kind of latest row where those advocating for child safety and child rights are taken to have a kind of malicious um, uh, a subplot where a kind of Trojan horse for uh, censorship and malicious governments. Um, and, it, it, and, and, and I can only think that one possible tactic is to keep a very clear separation between what's legal and, all, and what's harmful. And it's problematic for us because as John Kerr and I discussed many years ago, 
um, legal and harmful uh, are hard to discuss in the abstract. There is illegal for everyone, of course, but it is surely also illegal to cause harm to children. So, you know, we can kind of go round in a tongue twister here and it's not productive, but I just wanted to um, note that. Um, and I'll just briefly on your second question um, that you sent me, Yuta, which is about the role of technology companies and prevention. Um, and, you know, this has been a year not only of the general comment, but of an almighty row about um, encryption, when yet again, we have somehow found ourselves bizarrely advocating for child safety and child rights against those who advocate for privacy. You know, we, we, we find ourselves in some very unholy wars, and I just think it's time that this... Uh, I, I really hope this group can come up with some solutions that reposition um, what, what it is we're trying to um, advocate. I, I, what What... So, so you know, should we have seen the encryption debate coming and got skilled up in advance of it? For example, is the kind of question I, 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 I might ask us. Um, and uh, on that question of kind of anticipating and preventing, um, I guess I have, like many here, have thrown myself behind the kind of by design movement in the hope that if we can. Uh, successfully implement or encourage companies to implement privacy by design, safety by design, um, uh, security by design, ethics by design, I would say child rights by design. Uh, the question is, um, what can that bring? And is that the kind of movement that could be affected, not necessarily by heavy handed regulation against which companies will lobby, um, but through other means, through standards bodies, um, through training of young uh, digital professionals um, uh, through uh, trade associations and so forth. I don't know the answer, but I, I would love to hear people's thoughts here and I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sonia, for, for your short intervention and for sticking to the time. I would like to hand over to Amy before we go to the other speakers, because she has prepared uh, two questions also for participants in this session. Uh, and we would like to get an impression what they think about uh, the questions we have posed. Amy, over to you. Yes, I will just um, post in the chat one moment. Let's see if this works, it's always fun. Um, okay, so you'll see the URL um, and the code to enter. And if you would like to yeah, navigate there and enter that code, you should see a question. Um, Are people getting it? For me, yes, it does yes, work. It, the questions appear to require us to think and type at the same time. <laughs> so this will take the remainder of the session. <laughs> Great, so we have some results live in, in beautiful rainbow colors. We can't see that, that so far, Amy. Oh, you can't Could see you, it, yeah. I no, you need to share. Actually show you. Um, yeah, let's work out how to do that. Um, perhaps we'll go on to the... Okay, sorry, I was trying to. I think what I'll do is um, 
I think we have most of the results in. Um, also now, if you would refresh your screens, um, this is a just um, a very simple question um, that you can type in words. It will create a you know a, a cloud um, just to get some ideas of what people um, you know why people came to the session, but also what what are your thoughts on on you know the protection of children? Um, do you have particular um, thoughts that come to mind? And then I will. It doesn't refresh, Amy doesn't refresh mm, it's, no. interesting. it's it, I think it's refreshing now one moment okay that's okay let's focus on the first uh the first slide um so I think I will try and share my screen um So Jennifer uh, advised that probably you need to go to the next slide and then it will refresh for us as well. Yeah, I have I have actually done that. I think it's just not refreshing is the problem. Thank you for the support. Um, Okay, well, let's not waste too much time on this. Let me... Um... I'd suggest we just go on with the speakers. Yeah, oh, no, let's do that. Oh, yeah. now we can see it. Oh, now we can see Well, this is a screen share. Yeah, this, the, the second one isn't working. We'll just do this one. Um, and so what we have is a kind of a pretty equal uh, sort of mix between uh, just want information about the topic, which is great. I think it's really important the more people that get involved in, 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 in sort of thinking about this issue, um, the better um, agreement on some common ground and a roadmap for the future. And I really think, um, you know, as Sonia was just saying that, that that it's there's actually a lot more common ground and consensus than than the different sort of groups, interest groups um, uh, admit or, or make time to find. So I think that's really important that that's come out and prioritization of prevention. Um, so that's actually an interesting um, that from the get go, we have a a clear kind of uh, lead towards um, uh, uh, prevention as a, as a crucial um, part of this uh, this conversation. So great, I will hand back to you, Yuta. And if we can make the other one work later, then we will try to do so. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> With only eighteen percent saying they they expect a clear answer to the question we have put for this session uh, in regard of whether regulation and prevention uh, is a false dichotomy. Uh, I think it would be good to hear from our uh, further speakers. And uh, I think I go in alphabetical order because I don't want to prioritize at that point. And then Patrick Burton is the first one to speak after we already heard, had heard Sonia. Patrick, please. Great, thank you very much. And I'm I'm in the panic mode because I had in my head we had six or seven minutes rather than two. So I will just try to focus on one or two or eight, nine, ten points in those two minutes. Um, so first, um, you know, and I, I never know whether to take these things as interventions or provocations. If it was a provocation, I'd start off by saying that I'm very firmly of the view that regulation is simply politically expedient. Um, at the risk of angering all my colleagues and hugely respected um, colleagues in the room, I see John shaking his head already. I do not believe that's the case. I think it's an oversimplification. I think it is something we need to be very careful of. Um, I do think that we see an overemphasis on regulation. Um, but I really see regulation as one tool in the toolbox, one arrow in the quiver of prevention. Um, if you're looking at preventing online child sexual abuse and exploitation, cyberbullying, other forms of violence against children, regulation is essential, is critical, but isn't necessarily where the weight and the emphasis and the um, kind of primary investors investment should, should lie. 
I, I started by saying jokingly, you know, its regulation might be considered politically expedient. In some ways it is. It is because it shows that there is there are steps being taken by government, by those in position of power and authority and responsibility to protect children. It is step, there are steps that are often short term or medium term, and they change and they address the incredibly important sort of visual um, post fact violence that occurs, the child sexual abuse material that gets circulated, the, the sexual content that is everywhere on the internet that children have, have constant access to. However, it isn't changing what sits behind that. I mean, that is why I say it's essential, but it is also just one aspect of what needs to be done. And I do really think that, that it is easier to focus on regulation because prevention is about behavior change. It is about design change. It is, they are things that they change. It's about the way that children engage with technology, with the internet and parents support them and teachers and schools and everybody in communities support children to live their lives online. Those are longer term changes and they take more and they, they're, they're a bit kind of fluffy and, 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 um, and gray. Now, I come from a violence prevention background where that is where we know the evidence sits. Focus on early years, focus on early childhood development, focus on parenting support. We know that's evidence, those, that's where the evidence sits in terms of preventing violence, including child sexual abuse and violence within childhood, including sexual violence. So we know that evidence sits there. So what can we learn? Amy mentioned in the introduction that um, you know, it's very clearly, and, and Daniel Kopp went to Carterfelt and, and Catherine Matanowska have kind of very clearly sort of come up with this conceptual model on the intersection between drivers of on and offline violence. Sonia, there I mean, many people in this forum are exploring that. And we know that that intersection exists for different types of violence. Um, and so we need to be looking at how we learn from other sectors and what is the role of technology and what is the role of industry in supporting those kind of interventions as much as it is in terms of, um, of regulating platforms. Sonia mentioned safety by design and privacy by design. They're critical aspects. But for me, that's almost akin to crime prevention or violence prevention through environmental design. You know, we create safe streets by having street lighting, by cutting down grass, by making safe schools, by making sure that the girls' bathrooms are away from the boys' bathrooms, et cetera clear lighting and play, playgrounds, hugely important aspects. But how do we also invest in the other behavioral aspects and how do we support parents and caregivers from early years? How, how do we start build, building these conversations into ECD, early childhood development program, et cetera? Um, and we have some great examples and evidence of that starts to, where, where that's starting to work in the Pacific, in parts of East Asia, et cetera. Um, so for me, it really is about how we build these two collectively, how we don't skew the focus and the narrative and the tension on one at the expense of the other. And also to bear in mind that much of the narrative and the messaging around um, regulation tends to generate a sense of disempowerment by, children, by, by adults and by carers, by, by, by caregivers. And that tends to lead generally to more restrictive practices, which don't work in children's favor either. Um, so we need to think about how we build in, what do we know from public health about messaging, positive messaging, empowering, empowering messaging? How do we look at getting engaging technology and industry to support the wide range of intervention, prevention interventions, rather than just focusing on one over the other? I hope that made sense. That was my five pages input in, I hope, half a page. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I know that Sonia has to leave early. So I, I would like her to prepare for a short answer after we've heard the other two, uh, three speakers. Uh, just uh, to know that uh, Patrick has already referred to safety by design, privacy by design, but he has not referred to child rights by design, which I think is a wonderful idea. Um, now we go to Andreas Hautz from Jugendschutznet. Andreas, the floor is yours. I hope you can hear me well. Wonderful. Uh, because I, did, I got a new webcam earlier today, so I wasn't sure that it would work. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Andreas Hautz, uh, and I'm working for the Department of International Affairs at Jugendschutznet. 
um, thank you for the invitation and the chance to speak here. I will look at this topic on the basis of our practice and concrete work in this field. Uh, let me begin with some brief notes on our organization. We are the Joint Federal and State Center for the Protection of Minors on the Internet. Uh, our mission is to safeguard children's rights to participate and to be protected in the digital world, which means we look at risks in the internet services specifically attractive to young users. Our tasks are defined in the Inter Interstate Treaty on the Protection of Minors in the Media and the German, uh, German Youth Protection Act. <clears throat> Sorry for that. I'm talking about risks. I mean an enormous range of risks endangering and unharmed participation of children in the online world. Minors can be confronted with bullying, sexual harassment, uh, grooming, child sexual abuse material, and many other risks that violate their personal integrity. So what do we do about that? In our opinion, regulation and prevention go hand in hand. They have to come together. On one hand, there's a notice and takedown strategy by communicating with providers, partner hotlines, and law enforcement which leads to quick removal in more than 80% of our annual cases. But of course, it's not enough to react on reports. Providers have to act proactively as well, because it's not only an issue of removing harmful content, but also to create safe digital environments for children. So on the other hand, we also urge providers to design their services child-friendly. Providers have to consider safe settings and pre-settings in their safety by design concepts in the first place. For example, guidelines and terms of services need to be understandable, especially for young users. Of course, in this con context, we must also consider what needs to follow if the child has already been harmed. That means that also reporting mechanisms must be easy to understand and to use. Many of these claims, therefore, were taken up in the new Youth Protection Act, which entered into force this year in Germany, holding the industry more accountable. One could conclude regulation is needed to engage the providers to act, but you could also conclude that it is a process of analyzing and learning. But one thing I guess is for sure, regulation can help to lead to prevention. It must not, it can. Uh, yeah, it, it must, it should, so. <laughs> uh, so. Um, that said, of course, you cannot regulate everything. Media literacy, for example, is highly important and children as well as parents and teachers should be well educated in this field. We all have to find a way to gather how media literacy can be improved. Last but not least, there's another field I'd like to mention, the use of technological tools for automated detection. Uh, we can engage providers to use technolo technologies to prevent CSAM from being uploaded again and again, which most of them actually do. Hash checking and using photo DNA can help to stop the circle of abuse. In our opinion, it is crucial that providers have the possibility to do so, but also to always think about the consequences regarding other human rights and rights of the child, such as privacy. So of course we need to watch technologies closely. Again, it's always a process of learning. What is crucial in this process is transparency, I guess. We need to know exactly what can be done, will be done and actually is done to prevent online harm. Of course, the balance between privacy and protection can be an issue here. So we must address that. And by talking about it, help people to understand tools that seemingly may violate their right to privacy, but in fact don't. But we also need to listen closely if there might be concerns which are understandable and might not have been considered by us ourselves. Dialogue is the key to everything here, regardless we are talking about uh, prevention and or regulation. That said, regulation and prevention always have to come together, ideally hand in hand. As regulation never can be perfect from the beginning, it has to be developed continuously. Prevention might be a result of that, but can also come along with it. That's why organizations like ours monitor prevention strategies and urge providers to overthink uh, them, <clears throat> sorry, if they don't work properly. The job of civil society, I guess, is to engage providers to improve their measures and to help institutions and governments to evaluate and reflect their own efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. You are a very quick speaker, <laughs> but it was possible to follow. Just uh, tried to get it in time. <laughs> <laughs> the logic of your intervention, and we get back to that. So then we have now Diago Tavares. Hi, Diago? thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuta. Uh, thank you, Amy, the Kipat International, uh, John, and distinguished panelists for having me uh, on this session. It's a great honor uh, for me uh, to have this dialogue uh, with my longstanding child rights and child safety friends and fellow colleagues. My region, Latin America, is one of the dangerous places in the world for children to get out. To get out. Poverty, social inequalities, violence, and a lack of public policies to offer quality education for children is just some of our big and historical challenges. My country, Brazil, has more than 50,000 uh, mothers per year. And no, in nowadays, millions of children are out of school. Children are not safe there, never were even before internet exists. I'm recalling that because sometimes uh, we are missing those social and economic disparities uh, when we build regulation proposals uh, for the internet, which are in the end, a mirror of our societies. Different societies uh, will propose different approaches in regulation proposals based on the values, priorities, and political interests uh, on that particular moment. In Brazil nowadays, the federal government are proposing a terrible and asymmetric regulation to stop, I will repeat, to stop content moderation on hate speech, cyberbullying, harassment, neo-Nazi, and misinformation content. SafeNet Brazil and several child rights uh, organizations in Brazil wrote a statement opposing to such bad regulation proposal and offering a more nuanced and comprehensive approach based on transparency, accountability, and content moderation at scale, quality assurance KPIs in local language, such Portuguese, uh, instead of English only training data sets that are available today to detect harmful content and abusive behavior at scale. And uh, this debate is going on. It's already uh, uh, a lot of discussions on our National Congress. And another issue is the need of safeguards, checks and balances, comprehensive analysis of the policy options that we have, and the impact assessment on children's rights and the human rights as a whole. Uh, we, uh, as an experienced child safety expert, uh, should not endorse bad policies proposals that does not respect the due process of law or create negative externalities for people fundamental rights, uh, such as privacy, data protection, and freedom of speech. And this is particularly relevant uh, on the global south, uh, where ma mass uh, surveillance uh, scams has been deployed by authoritarian governments to carry on unlawful and abusive uh, operations targeting high profile journalists and human rights defenders. SafeNet Brazil would uh, like to take this opportunity to applause the Biden administration to blacklist uh, the Spire firm NSO group. We also welcome the UN ad hoc committee to elaborate a comprehensive international convention on countering the use of information and communications technologies for criminal uh, proposals. We all know that there's no easy answers, but working together in a most stakeholder fashion we can face and better address those uh, challenges. Uh, I will finish here, and this is my initial uh, remarks. And thank you uh, so much again uh, for having me. It's a great pleasure and looking forward to for the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Thiago. Uh, I think we, we will come back to that question whether regulation could have such a counterproductive effect that you said before. Uh, with uh, stopping uh, 
stopping content moderation probably by law. We, we will talk about that later. Michael, the floor is now yours for uh, an, an organization with longstanding experience in uh, dealing with child sexual abuse imagery and its removal from the internet. Thanks very much, um, Uta. So I hope you, hope you can hear me okay. So um, it, I'm going to focus my remarks largely around uh, the, the UK's draft online safety bill. The IWF has been um, heavily involved in terms of the, the development of the online safety bill. Um, and obviously the, the bill places um, a, a duty of care um, on platforms that have user to user services um, or search providers uh, to ensure the safety of their users um, on their services. Um, principally, the duty of care and the online safety bill tries to bring in um, the online world in line with the offline world, as we've spoken previously, um, and, and, uh, and align the two. So what is illegal on, on, uh, offline should also be illegal online. Um, and the duty of care is a very well established um, regulatory approach in the same way that we have seatbelts in cars these days, and in the same way that playgrounds um, have to take account of health and safety um, reg regulations. One thing I would say though, is that regulating is complex and it takes time. We've seen the UK, EU and Australia, just to name a few, as Amy helpfully outlined at the start, taking um, particular time and care over the proposals that they're bringing forward. And um, in the UK, it's taken about five years since the um, introduction um, of, of an online safety bill, the pledge in the Conservative Party's manifesto back in 2015. And we're, we're still at a draft stage with, with that piece of legislation. So regulation is complex. So in the context of the regulation versus prevention angle, I think I would agree with my other speakers that this is about both regulation and prevention as well. Um, we must ensure that we prevent as well as regulating um, to, to improve um, the online world for children and young people. So what must regulation do? Well, at the IWF, we think that regulation should build on best practice. So for the last 25 years, the IWF has been removing large volumes of child sexual abuse material quite successfully from the internet. We have some of the fastest removal times anywhere in the world, as Andreas um, also help, helpfully outlined earlier in terms of the, the German hotlines as well. Hotlines do remove content um, in, incredibly quickly, and we want to see that that's built on. The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse in the UK recently concluded that the IWF was a large part of the success story as to, as to reasons why comparatively little child sexual abuse content was hosted in the UK. And that's down to the uh, partnership approach that we take to working with industry, with law enforcement, with the government and our other child protection charities um, in order to, to make the UK a hostile environment to host this content. So firstly, we think it should build on best practice. Secondly, in this area, there's a lot of um, international collaboration already as well. So the fact that um, electronic service providers have to report to the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, for example, and they act as the sort of clearinghouse and prioritisation pathway for law enforcement is critically important. So any other attempts to introduce mandatory reporting, which we may see through the, some of the EU's proposals, for example, for a new centre, needs to complement um, the current approach um, and, and not duplicate that effort and simply um, add, add more reports into the system. We, we, we must ensure that we are safeguarding children as a result of it. And thirdly, we think that any regulation should be principles based, flexible and reactive to new changes in technology, as we've seen that technology often outpaces um, regulation. Um, and it's really important that, uh, that, it, that it's very principles based and flexible and, and, and change uh, and to changes. Um, and finally, we think that uh, it's really important, and I think this has again been touched on by the other panelists, and Sonia mentioned it at the start as well, which is about respecting the rights of children, their right to privacy, and their right to uh, childhood free from abuse and exploitation as well. And I think that that's going to be particularly important, and we need to take away some of the lessons that we've currently seen through um, the privacy directive as that's gone, uh, as the temporary derogation has gone through um, in the uh, EU uh, recently as well. And finally, I just want to touch on the separation between illegal, harmful and other grey areas as well. I think it's really, really important that we do have clear legal standards and definitions in any legislation that we create. I think as was touched on earlier, this is going to be really pretty crucial to the UK's um, online safety bill. 
But what we have seen in the area of child sexual abuse is that clear legal definitions and standards are very important to achieving consensus. Many of the companies that we work with deploy our services on an international basis. Having clear standards of, about what is or isn't illegal is, is very helpful for them in terms of acting um, uh, across, across the world in terms of the deployment of some of the solutions. However, that does not mean to say that companies should not go further in terms of doing more. And we can all do more um, in, in order to protect children online. And just some of the examples that the IWF are putting into account is things like the World First Report Remove, which enables children to self-refer images of themselves. Um, and if they meet uh, the illegal threshold, we can remove them. And we're also looking at what more we could do in images that don't meet the threshold um, as well. And finally, um, just on the, uh, another tool that we're, that we're using, we've developed a taxonomy and a tool called Intelligrade, which allows us to map to UK, US, Canadian, New Zealand, and the Interpol baseline standard, which enables us to add more detail of what, about what's behind an image so that it can meet various international classifications. As the forthcoming EU legislation around the CSAM review comes forward, this will be really, really important as well um, uh, and an important tool to consider how we can look at more closer collaboration across the EU next year as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. That was very uh, helpful indeed. And I have, have some ideas how we can go further with the debate. But first of all, I would like to invite Sonia um, to react to what Patrick Burton said in the beginning in regard of uh, an overemphasis on regulation. And what do you think in regard of uh, making the best interest of the child a primary consideration? Do we have an option to say yes, and we can achieve that only when we over overemphasize uh, regulation? Or do you think we need a balance? Um. It's a good question. And in fact, I've been thinking a lot about um, best interests uh, recently because it's somehow taken off. It's become the phrase that's everywhere. Um, I, um, you know, there's a very interesting general comment on what is the best interests of the child, which sets out some really clear and helpful kind of procedures as well as clarity on outcomes. And I think um, sometimes people think the best interests might be a thing, a box that can be ticked. Oh yes, we've attended to the child's best interest. It really does signal a very kind of careful process of weighing how any particular decision or intervention um, might affect any or all of children's rights. And it needs to be either an individual decision for a particular child or more difficult, a collective decision. Um, and often, um, platforms and digital providers, actually governments too, are in the business of making a, a collective decision. Um, that is incredibly difficult. Um, I um, heard um, from some platforms um, recently um, talk of the notion of the average child. Um, uh, meeting the best interests of the average child is not going to meet the best interests of the children that I think we're um, concerned about here. So I think we need to be very careful in, in, in supporting any notions of, of averages. But undoubtedly, it is um, it's a demanding requirement of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, even though it's absolutely right, that um, uh, when we make any intervention, whether it's for empowerment or for education or for privacy or for protection, that we recognize all the possible consequences on children's rights. And the general comment, um, uh, uh, as Yuta knows well, because she read many drafts, um, was very kind of careful to try to say, you know, we, we are promoting, we, we need to promote a particular right in relation to the digital environment, but always having an eye to those to those other um, consequences. So back to the, the sort of taking that in the direction of the question of um, regulation and the role of regulation. I guess um, I'm, it seems to me a clearer case to make that we should advocate for regulation in relation to what we might call hygiene factors, that um, businesses and governments must be required to do um, ensure children's safety, privacy, security, um, equity. 
Uh, and if you like, those are the hygiene, those are the things that we want sorted because otherwise they will be problematic. And whether they are done by top-down policy or by design, um, I think is something we could debate and might be different in, in the circumstances. But all those other children's rights, the right to education, the right to play, um, the right to um, enjoying family life, the right to growing to their fullest development, the right to voice, um, it's hard to, I mean, governments have those obligations, but I think it's hard to translate that into, if you like, platform regulation. And that's where the strength of a by design solution comes in, I think, because if we can um, um, influence or, as it were, spread the word about the importance of children's rights, um, I don't know if we go and knock on the door of platforms, but I, I, I do think there's a lot to be done with um, intermediaries, um, uh, funders, trainers, those who um, manage procurement processes, um, those who audit um, uh, the private sector. Um, there, you know, there are lots of intermediaries, tra uh, standards bodies and, 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 and trade associations, as I, as I mentioned before. There's lots of organizations that are already addressing ethics, already addressing discrimination, already addressing hate and so forth. We just need to get child rights onto that agenda because I don't think we're gonna pass laws that require platforms to meet the full range of children's rights though it would be interesting to to argue that but let's focus for regulation on the hygiene factors and think other ways to get the bigger picture that would be my suggestion thank you thank you so much that is very helpful to further our debate um i think uh amy it's time now to have your second question on the mentee is that possible or shall we go ahead with the discussion? We can certainly try. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's, yeah. I you, mean, while, let's see if while, it loads. Yeah. Yes. While you um, set it up, I, I'd just like to encourage uh, participants in the session to put their questions in the chat to all of our speakers to to give us reason to to discuss further. Um, and we are looking at the chat while Amy is setting up uh, the mentee, where we get an impression uh, um, on the atmosphere yeah. in the room, in the digital room. Yeah, I think um, if, if it's working well um, and you will refresh the code I sent earlier in the chat, it should be fine. I can resend it if anyone missed it. Um. I think we still have the first question and the mentee. We don't yeah. have a fresh one. I see the original question. Yeah, yes. well, it's refreshing, but not working. Um, is everyone refreshing their own screens? Yes. Mm, okay. Okay, maybe we use the time just to go back to our speakers and uh, maybe um, Okay, Jennifer, who is in the room says there are some people on site in the room that don't have the opportunity to go to, to Zoom. So Jennifer, if you could help us gathering questions probably from the room and put them in the chat, would that be possible? Okay, wonderful. In the time in between, um, I remember that uh, Andreas, you spoke about automatic detection of child sexual abuse material. And I was wondering at that point, uh, what is your position, Patrick, to this automatic detection? That is kind of a prevention, but I think it's another type of prevention than the one that you were talking about when you spoke about early childhood intervention. So how yeah. do we balance these different types yeah. of prevention? Thanks for that question. Certainly, I, I do not see that as mutually exclusive, and I, I, I would firmly support the idea that automatic detection of, of child sexual abuse material is 
is necessary, it's mandatory, it should not be an option. Um, and I think the use of tools like that are really effective. I would want to go one further though, because I think that if we're going to look at the use of those tools, I would want to see complementary um, enforcement of how platforms respond to things like reporting, how they respond, what sort of referral processes and victim support processes are put in place. So for me, CSAM tools focus on what I was essentially kind of the, the thing that scare us the most, um, the sort of worst, um, worst form of violence that children experience. There's a lot more um, sometimes that escalates to that, other forms of violence that children experience before they are actually engaged in, or they, they are abused in, through, to produce child sexual abuse material. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that goes unreported and that, that doesn't warrant reporting to the IWF hotline, um, which is a critical tool. Um, and I would want to see how pressure is put on platforms to respond timelessly, to act um, in a way that protects victims when they do report different forms of violence, not just child sexual abuse material, if that makes sense. That for me would be very useful regulation to go along. You know, it's, it's, it's how we hold platforms and, and industry accountable for handling reports. That, that's just one example. I hope that makes sense. It was clearer in my mind. Mm -hmm. I think it was help. I, thank you. I think uh, it furthers the debate. Andreas, would you like to react to that position? I guess it's not not a real uh, different position uh, I, I have. It's 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 very near. I, I guess um, what what I'd like to add is um, uh, regarding the, the the whole discussion about hashtagging is that um, we we uh, lived through it last December when uh, there was this issue and the whole discussion around the temporary derogation. And, and I'd like to emphasize that, that I, I think we need to be fast and up to date. Parts of the tech companies address this issue pretty well and serious, but uh, we fail to, to develop a satisfying and, and accurate regulatory framework for them. So uh, most of the social media platforms uh, use hash checking and AI to prevent child abuse from being uploaded or distributed on the platforms. But um, uh, I'd like to, to stress this out because as I worked as a hotline analyst for nearly four years and it's not only uh, the, the, the most important issue of course is uh, the protection of survivors in this field. But it's not, not only that, it's, it's also the protection for analysts who have to, to rewatch this stuff again and again and, and that's really harmful also to the people who have to assess content. And um, so, uh, I, I think, uh, but, but Patrick also mentioned it before, um, hash checking is, uh, sh shouldn't be an issue. Oh, thank you, Andreas. Amy, did I hear you? Okay, no, no. Thank you, Andreas. Oh, you uh, said no. that in many cases, we need to react really fast. And on the same, uh, at the same time, Michael said before, your regulating is complex and it needs, uh, it takes time. We all know that we, you said it took five years since the introduction of an online safety bill pledge. It also took us more or less five years to come out with the amended use protection uh, act in Germany. So we, we know regulation needs time, but at the same time, we we know that uh, we need a fast reaction to certain developments. And uh, I, I want to invite uh, the speakers as well to, to answer that question about whether we should just rely on, on the platform providers that they take the action in due time as fast as possible to react or, or whether we, we wait for uh, the regulation to come into force to be developed and then to come into force and to take effect, which of course might in some, some cases even too late because the internet is so fast developing. We have new technologies and it's really very difficult to keep up the pace with that. 
Um, Thiago, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, John, rise the ring before. Do you want to go for us? No, no, no. Brains before beauty. You go first, Thiago. <laughs> <laughs> you are a gentleman, <laughs> my friend. Thank you very much, Jota. Uh, for sure, we need some uh, regulation, but I would like to add a comment on, on the system automatic tools. Of course, they, we need it, especially due to the scale of the problem. We can all solve that without automated tools, without AI, without machine learning, without e NLP and other technologies that can detect, proactively detect uh, system uh, at scale, including to prevent uh, the upload of uh, knowing uh, system uh, images. However, uh, that solution uh, should be implemented in a way that uh, not affect others' uh, human rights or create uh, undesired uh, effects or, or undesired standard, standard, negative standards. And uh, when we, we also need to consider, in my view, uh, the size of the company and the scale uh, and the volume of incidents that involve children. I will give you an example. For example, Apple. Apple has uh, only 100 people working uh, in incipient trust and safety uh, team. And this is the number for worldwide. And that number was uh, they figured out in a public hearing uh, at uh, the, the, the UK Parliament, uh, I think it's unbelievable to to uh, that a such big company has only one hundred people carry on of all trust and safety issues that affect users worldwide, including children. And when they take the cheapest uh, solution in the market. Uh, to, uh, to, to announce the uh, plans to engage with child uh, safety and child protection issues. This is something that we as child safety experts and, and, and advocates, we was asking Apple for do that for more than two decades. And, and they decide to do now, which is great, wonderful. It's a very well welcome announcement, but it's not enough because there's a lot of uh, uh, content that is harmful for children that will not be detected because they does they 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 try to avoid to create a real and full service trust and safety uh, structure to able to be able to detect harassment, cyberbullying, non consensual share of intimate images, sex extortion, and all those kind of things that violate uh, children's rights. So this is my. Uh, uh, overview and, and uh, uh, contribution for this debate. But I wondered, of course, my dear friend John uh, perhaps has a different view, and I wanted to <laughs> hear uh, his thought uh, on that. Thank you, Thiago. Uh, John, would you would you like to take the floor and tell us? I, I've seen you're uh, nervous to speak. Me nervous to speak. What? <laughs> no, I, I don't want to upset Patrick by telling him that I agreed very, very much with nearly everything he said. Uh, I apologise if that is upsetting Patrick. But <laughs> um, look, I think of my, I think of myself and most of the organisations or many of the organisations I, I work with as being uh, involved in the world of campaigning and lobbying, and therefore we are involved in the world of politics. And politics is about, absolutely, it's, it's about expediency at one level, uh, but fundamentally what it's about is trying to achieve what is possible at a given moment in time. So now, obviously, we need, and this doesn't, isn't meant to sound patronising, we need some, the best possible research. We need the best possible intellectual input. We need the best possible set of independent experts to help guide us. But at the end of the day, imperfect though it is always likely to be, we are struggling to achieve the best we can. 
in the given uh, climate, which is why, by the way, I lose a, a little bit of patience with the old school internet governance idea that the internet is a global system and must be run in a global way. It's bullshit. Uh, every, every country, I mean, Brazil is not the same as Britain. North yeah. Korea is not the same as Sweden. And I think this idea of having global standards and a global system has been an obstacle that has been deliberately used by people who don't agree with the perspectives that many of us will have to delay it, uh, to delay change or keep things as they are uh, <clears throat> for as long as possible. Just one very uh, quick point in response to what Sonia was saying earlier. If you look a lot at a lot of the of what we now think of as the main corpus of human rights legislation, um, and indeed the UNCRC, the U human rights legislation emerged in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. It was addressing some of the worst abominations of human rights and human dignity that, that the world had ever seen, in, certainly in modern times. And the UNCRC, like the human rights corpus, it's pre-internet. And this idea of the best right, the best interest of the child, that came from a world and a time when everybody that was important in a child's life at least had the possibility of knowing the child, meeting the child, the doctor, the teacher, the nurse, the shopkeeper. That's not that world is gone. Some of the most important players and actors in the child's life this now are on the other side of the planet. And the question is, how do we devise systems that we, I'm, and I get Sonia's point about the average child is not a, an individual child, but we're going to have to find some way of, of coming up with a framework that, that actually recognizes, we, we don't want to give uh, internet companies all that information about an individual child. We, we need systems that somehow can, can find a middle way. And my last word is this. Antigone Davis, the head of global safety and trust or whatever her title is for, for Facebook or Meta, she appeared before the House of Commons in London uh, virtually. Uh, and she said, we have no interest in providing an environment which is unsafe for children. We have no, there is no commercial interest to us or profit for us as a company in having an environment which doesn't work in a, in a way that's safe for children. Of course, that's true. That's never been the issue. The issue is what priority companies attach to solving these problems. The most valuable mm -hmm. asset that any internet company has is engineering time, engineering time. And the mm -hmm. question every CEO of every tech company makes pretty much every day is how do I deploy that asset, engineering time in the best interest of my company today? So unless they're feeling threatened by, in terms of their revenue, or in terms of their reputation, the, the inertia sets in and it just slips down, it slips down the, the list, which is why regulation is essential. If we leave it to companies to make their own decisions about how they respond, we'll get what Tiago was saying, companies employing tiny numbers of people because they can get away with it. And it's, that's no longer acceptable anymore. Thank you, John, for your uh, strong intervention. I, I think we will get back to the question of whether harmonization, uh, legal harmonization is necessary or whether it's impossible. Like you said, we have differences between South Korea and Sweden. But I, I would put that at the end of the session because we have now two interventions from the floor in uh, Katowice. Um, and as I assume that uh, Yavri, I hope I spell that, I pronounce that well, Yavri Carr from the Technical University of Munich, uh, he has a question uh, in regard of children who are influencers. So we are turning now for, for some five to five minutes uh, to children as uh, users themselves. And we take first Javri Carr and then uh, Jennifer Chung. Please, Javri, can you speak or shall, Hello. shall Jennifer? Okay, she's yes, there. Yes, I can. Um, yes, I actually wanted to ask about um, this kind of children that we see on social media that I think they, there are two kinds of these influencers. One, one of them are, 
kids that are maybe um, developing a project or even a business with their parents and their parents are using them like for um, um, advertising or like as models or I mean to sell these kind of products or services and another kind of influencers could be the ones that are act um, activists for example I have seen in Colombia there's um, really famous ch child that he is a climate activist and he's always in Twitter and YouTube and all the social media so I wanted to know um, in both cases how could we regulate or how the um, the rights of these of these children are protected and Yes, I wanted to know about the legitimization also about these participations in social media. Oh, thank, thank you for your question. Um, I know that Jugendschutznet has done some work in this regard, but I don't think it's the same department that you're working in, Andreas. Are, no, no. are you even ready to answer the question or anyone else from the panel? Um, I'm, I'm not really ready, I guess, because uh, it wasn't, not it wasn't my department but uh, i know the research but it uh, it focused more on the risks of influencers so i i don't think that this would be the point is anyone else in the panel or from the room who has an answer to the question of yavri patrick i I don't have an answer, but I guess my comment would be that certainly you know, I I think the fact that you made the distinction is good because I think there's a very real distinction to be made between those two influences. And I think child influences that are used to market specific products um, that actually are often harm or lifestyles that are often actually harmful for children that we know are harmful for children. Um, I think clearly there is a role for regulation there. Um, and I'm just thinking maybe I'm now picking and choosing, you know, what we regulate, what we don't re regulate. But, uh, but companies are subject to laws and regulation that govern the use of child labor, for example. Um, and if companies or businesses, whether, whether they are micro enterprises or startups or big corporations, if they're using children to market products that are uh, a, if they if they are engaged in any sort of exploitative or extractive relationship with children as with ch child influencers, I think there's a role for regulation there. Whether it is regulation within this industry or whether it is regulation that is covered through child labor laws at a national level, I think is is going to be a conversation that needs to be had. Um, but I know you know in parts of of East Asia, for example, and Southeast Asia, we also seeing um, cases where child influences are being used to market lifestyles or to promote lifestyles or promote products that are ultimately harmful to children as well. Um, and clearly there's a role, there, there is a need for some sort of management of that situation to prevent the, that kind of activity. So I don't have an answer, but I mean, that's, you know, that's my personal view on it. Um, I'm not sure if it's adding anything. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I would like to turn then to Jennifer. Jennifer, would you like to take the floor with your question? Thank you, Yuta. Uh, my name is Jennifer Chung. I actually have a couple of hats in the IG space, but really I'm asking this question in the lens of the Dot Kids Foundation, which has the mission and vision to create a child-friendly internet via the, the namespace Dot Kids. And I think we've worked quite closely with a lot of you who have spoken, John Carr and Ekpat and also Tiago Tavares. And we really want to, to we really want to, to get the expert opinion because you, you all work in this space, in, in the child rights and child uh, rights organization space where it's not just uh, one kind of one solution. There's like multi levels of, of, of things that we need to keep in mind, both in terms of regulation and more so in the way that we proactively look at keeping uh, a, a, an internet namespace that is friendly and beneficial for children. So I really want to hear a little bit more from the panel on the things that we definitely should keep in mind. I know that 
Um, I heard from uh, Patrick earlier that, you know, there is, um, uh, it's not just regulation and there's other things that we need to do. And from Tiago, that's, you know, other regions, we really need to have these kind of training materials in languages other than English, because there is, you know, Latin America and also the Asia Pacific, there's many communities and uh, peoples and vulnerable communities, especially the children who, who don't have um, you know, English as a first language. So I really want to get a sense from you because we are looking towards you as the expert to guide us in, in, in a way that we can create this namespace. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for this question. Uh, I forgot to mention that, of course, uh, the Dot Kid Foundation has also been working for a long time with the Dynamic Coalition and has uh, become a member uh, some time ago. So. Uh, glad for the panelists to answer your question, and probably I will also chime in. Who would like to? I see Thiago nodding very heavily. <laughs> so please thank, go ahead. Thank you, Jutta. And thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a great uh, pleasure to, to see you on the screen. Uh, and um, well, I, I'm going to share some thoughts on that. Um, I think the dot kids uh, case is a very unique, is a very uh, positive and very unique experience, uh, in, especially for the, your long-standing uh, commitment with uh, media literacy and with child safety uh, development of child safety policy on the name space, the domain name space, and definitely is a very uh, special, unique experience, and, uh, and, and everybody should look at. Uh, for that particular case to better understand how can we improve this discussion on the name space, in, uh, domain name space as well. I would say that one particular thing that you mentioned, which is diverse language diversity, it's become really, really important, even more important now than it was before. And I would like to give you uh, an example of how we are collaborating with uh, the DOT BR, uh, Nick BR, uh, which is the responsible for the dot .BR uh, uh, country code uh, top level domain. And we uh, are was looking for patterns to detect uh, keywords in Brazilian Portuguese that was more prevalent on websites that was uh, uh, spreading child sexual abuse material, but also uh, other kinds of uh, 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 harmful content uh, involving children. And um, that exercise uh, make it possible to identify hundreds, hundreds of uh, new uh, keywords that was not uh, under the Radar was not using by the, the, the training uh, systems that is used to detect those kind of uh, abusive uh, behavior. And we just share uh, our key lists in Portuguese uh, for Twitter. Twitter, for, for example, this is a this is public. Twitter announced it published the results of this uh, collaboration, and they discovered two hundred nine nine different keywords in Portuguese that was not, they were, they were not aware before this exercise. So uh, that's evidence, it's, it's something that materialized the argument that you said, when we, we need more diversity, language diversity uh, uh, in no English uh, training data sets to better um, apply those uh, policies, not only uh, on, on social media and applications uh, layer, but also, and why not, uh, on the name uh, domain name space uh, as well. Thank you so much for your questions, and, and I give you back the floor to Juta or perhaps my my friend John Carr. Good to uh, with thank, you. Thank you, Thiago. Uh, since I don't see any further hand from the panelists, neither comments or questions in the uh, chat and I'm reminded that we only have 10 minutes left so I'm 
I'm really glad that Jennifer turned us to, to the issue of creating safe spaces for children. Uh, and I would like to add without restricting their rights to access to information and their rights to peaceful assembly and association, their right to play and so on and so on. And how we, do we solve this, this uh, issue with on the one hand, we want these safe spaces for children. Um, we have heard from uh, Michael Tunks that in the UK online safety bill, there is a provision for duty of care for platform providers. And we have the same in the German uh, Youth Protection Act with the duty of care and uh, uh, an open-ended list of measures that may be taken, can be taken uh, by platform providers to fulfill their duty of care. But it's, it's necessary to know that it's an open-ended list. And it's, of course, there is, room for, for platform providers to develop their own measures that would help us to create these safe spaces for children. Um, on the same, uh, but also we see that uh, we have parts of regulation that have a counterproductive effect. When the uh, e-privacy directive came into force in, in Europe uh, last year in December, nearly, uh, 12 month, month ago and uh, somehow the safe space for children was reduced due to the fact that uh, uh, for most of the platform providers they stopped moderating uh, content. Uh, and of course we are seeing that we need to have a harmonized regulation uh, across Europe. We have seen that with a harmonized um, uh, GDPR uh, also, we, it had its effects uh, on international level in other countries where uh, the same regulation was copied or adopted in another way. But so, of course, there is a need for harmonization, but how do we, how do we avoid that we have uh, a collateral damage with this harmonization when, on the other hand, we have good national regulation uh, that helps creating a safe space and that could probably be overruled uh, by, by harmonized legislation across a certain region of the world like, like Europe or uh, in other types as well. I, I would like to invite uh, the panelists and of course also people in the room uh, uh, to respond to this. Uh, is that the dichotomy, diff difficult word for me, uh, when we ask for harmonization on the one hand, uh, legal harmonization, and on the other hand, we also see that there are national differences, regional differences, and that we probably have uh, different levels of, of safety uh, for children in, in different parts of the world. Would you mind focusing on, on your final statement uh, in this regard? Maybe we... we take now the 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 other uh, the order in the other way and Michael you would like to start thanks very much Rita so um yeah I think this has been a really useful discussion today um I think that uh, as we outlined at the start that this isn't just about um re regulation or prevention it needs to be both I think there are certainly steps that companies and platforms can take now to ensure that their services are free from child sexual abuse and exploitation the services that the IWF provides are um, incredibly um, effective in that way. Just three companies alone in one month blocked 8.8 .8 million attempts in April 2020 to access known child sexual abuse material. That is a staggering amount of, um, uh, uh, of uh, attempts to access child sexual abuse material. We can't say that each one of those is an individual trying to access child sexual abuse material, but what we can tell you is that it's an awful um, amount of stuff. There, is, there are things that they can do. I think there's there's always ways that we can we can improve. There's always more that we can do. Um, but I think um, as we look to uh, you know greater regulation around the globe, I think there's a need for the, the dynamic coalition for child safety groups to um, sort of harmonise their voice around some of the key topics, such as um, children's right to privacy online, children's rights to a childhood free from child sexual abuse and exploitation, children's rights to play and have access to information, for example, um, and also how we align those uh, with the competing priorities around some of the, some of the things that we've seen around encryption. 
it has to be possible to keep children safe online as well as uh, as well as uh, protecting um, privacy as well. I don't think we should talk about the two as a dichotomy. And I think that similarly, it shouldn't be a dichotomy between regulation and prevention either. Uh, it should be possible to have both. And we all need to work together in order to um, improve uh, online safety for children. My final remarks would be, as we move towards regulation, I think context is really, really important, particularly around transparency reports. I think we really need to know how much content is being taken out from that is actually illegal. I think we need um, to understand if companies are making large numbers of reports to the National Centre for Missing and Exploiting Children, is that because they're very good at finding it? Or is that because um, you know, they have a problem on their platform? So I think uh, regulation throws up some very, very interesting questions, um, but we need to move uh, both, both towards regulation and prevention um, and build on best practice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I would now like to turn to Thiago. One sentence only, please, because we have only five minutes left. And I think Amy will also uh, wrap up uh, what has been said in this session at the end. So Thiago, please. In one sentence, Guter. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure with, to take part of this very, very qualified debate. and. Uh, to contribute with and share my, my vision uh, from a perspective that is not uh, usually uh, considered, which is the perspective for the global South, especially uh, in the countries of Latin America, uh, which has some particular particularities that uh, it's important to, to consider as well. Thank you so much. This is my Thank you. We appreciate that you gave also the, the view or, and the perspective from Latin America, which is really important to get a, a broader view on, on this issue. Andreas, your turn. I'd like to second what uh, Tiago, Michael and, and you said before. Um, and um, I, I just come back. I, I, I also don't see a dichotomy between regulation and prevention. I think that it has come to, to come to get together. Uh, but I'd like to, to um, focus again on, on uh, the problems with the temporary derogation last year. Not, I, I don't want to uh, make a big thing out of it now, but I just want to focus again on it to show that it is really crucial that regulation and harmonization have to work together and have to uh, work properly because uh, we, we, we cannot... Um, afford to, to lose again nearly 60% of reports on, on child sexual abuse. And, and so I guess it's not, all, not only the big thing we have to focus on, but also the details. And thank you very much that uh, you invited me to speak here. Thank you, Andreas. I will, I will take that pledge forward to the uh, workshop number 170, Child Protection Online, How to Legislate, which will be held in 30 minutes time in uh, room six. Uh, and there we will continue the debate exactly in that direction, uh, referring also to the Digital Services Act. Um, if I go in alphabetical order, I would like to take John before we then go to Patrick again. Uh, John, your thoughts on harmonization? Well, I mean, I'm against sin. Um, and I'm in favor of everything being nice. Uh, so harmonization is a wonderful idea, but I I'm afraid too many people who I think of as an enemies in inverted commas, uh, use that as an obstacle or a delaying tactic. We, in our own jurisdictions, in our own ways, we have to do the best that we can to make it work for the children in our own countries. And I I'm absolutely refuse anymore to delay um, that while I wait for this harmonization thing or this globalization thing to come walking down the street. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Patrick and then Amy for a quick wrap up of the session. Thank you. So I think har harmonization at the end, it's a whole another conversation. I actually ag agree with John there. You know, I work in, in 12 or 13 countries at the moment that can't harmonize their own legislation, their own definitions, even of CSAT. So it's a yeah. real major challenge. And 
that is one of the reasons that I think not to not to do not to undermine the role that regulation has. I think that focusing on different aspects of prevention to a large degree allow the sort of adaptation and local adaptation and contextual adaptation that you need. Um, so again, that balance, they're not mutually exclusive, but I would like to see more emphasis there. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Amy, one minute. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'll be very quick um, because I mean, I think so much has been said, but I think just to sum up the, you know, the overall, um, the overall uh, messages are that, that there's a general consensus that we need, we need both, which I think is an outcome that, that I suppose many of us uh, kind of were expecting, but it's interesting. What's complex is the balance you find. I think what I've also been hearing is about um, the importance of context, that you can't have these universal rules. Um, there are some universal basic rules, but you really need to understand the context that's happening um, in each country or jurisdiction, um, and that we need to be working much more proactively to, to um, work out how to bring um, different challenges um, in relation to this topic together in order to find sustainable uh, solutions. But I think it's been a fascinating conversation. I will be uh, writing up the report in the next few weeks. And thank you so much for, for joining. Thank you, Jutta. Thanks to all of you. And I hope to see you in room six in 30 minutes for the session on child protection on, on, online where we can continue the debate. Thank you and have a good IGF. And if you have been traveling, a safe trip back home. See you, bye-bye. <laughs>